Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Out on Film. My name is Craig Hardesty, and I am delighted to be here today in conversation with the team from Ahead of the Curve. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and introduce Belinda Hernandez with um, Out on Film, who is going to be conducting this conversation. And Belinda, I will turn it over to you to make introductions and get started. Absolutely. Thank you, Craig. Uh, I am Belinda, and I am absolutely honored and thrilled to uh, be able to do this interview with the filmmakers of uh, Ahead of the Curve. Let me start first by the founder of Curve Magazine, Franco Stevens. Thank you so much for joining us. And then director, co-producer, Jen Rainin. Ladies, what a pleasure it is to have you today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, it's absolutely. Um, when I was asked to do this, when I was asked to look at the film, asked to do this, let me tell you, it immediately brought me back to a 30 something year old woman because uh, I was one of the ladies who would get that magazine and look at it every month. And, and you know, it was, it was unlike anything I've ever seen. You know, uh, let me just start by saying that, of course, it captured lesbian culture. I remember the term lesbian chic back in the day. Can you talk a little bit, Franco, about, um, you know, how your vision might have shaped lesbian culture or was it something organic? Take us a little bit through that whole thing of, of the early days of Curve and what you saw starting to come to fruition within the community. Well, I started the magazine mostly because I wanted it and I believed like, okay, instead of just complaining that no one else was producing this thing, I was going to do it. And I was, you know, 21 or 22 at the time when I got the idea. And, um, you know, I wanted something to inform me as a young uh, baby dyke at the time, um, you know, what was going on in the community, how I could become a member of the community, because I really didn't feel included. Um, and, you know, I, if you pictured me back then, I was, you know, short haired, kind of trying to look a little butch and trying to fit in. And then I realized, oh, wait, I, I really like femme girls, but I don't feel like they're getting an equal billing in our community. Like they're not being recognized within our own community. So that's something I knew I wanted to like to, to dispel right away with the magazine is to show the full, um, you know, gamut of who we are and who we love. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it kind of walks through lesbian culture. I remember uh, the, the word celesbian. Um, you finally got that on the cover, so lesbian, a, le a lesbian celebrity. Talk a little bit about who that first person was for those who haven't seen the film. Talk a little bit about how uh, that came to be. Sure. Well, the, the first celesbian we got was uh, Melissa Etheridge who was, you know, such a, such a kind and nice and generous person with us through the history of the magazine and ended up also being, uh, you know, a part of the film. Um, and for us, oh, this is it. We've made the big time. We've got, a, you know, we've got Melissa Etheridge on the cover, uh, she, you know, for a celebrity to come out, um, at that time was monumental. She had so much to risk and, um, you know, trusting us with her story really uh, made, made us feel like uh, we did, not only had we hit the big time, but we were more acceptable to, I, I don't wanna say more acceptable, we were more accessible rather mm -hmm. to um, the women in our community and those beyond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, also one thing that struck me while watching this documentary um, was amazing home video that was shot when you started this magazine, you went to the various women's festivals. Jen, as a filmmaker, you probably thought, I hit the jackpot with this. Um, t t tell us a little bit about how you were able to take that and so beautifully piece it together and weave it into telling the story. Well, I'll tell you, when I first saw all that footage, um, I, I wasn't, I hadn't quite gotten to the place where I was thinking of making a film. I saw it as a lot of boxes in our garage. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we got to the point where I was uh, ready to, to tell this story, when I felt really compelled to tell the story, I realized what a treasure that was in, our, in my garage. It was so great. Um, 
piecing it all together, oh gosh. I mean, that was one of the greatest joys of creating this film was was just getting to immerse ourselves, myself and and my uh, co-director Ricardo, um, in just spending hour after hour watching every piece of this footage and getting getting to you know transport ourselves into that time period in the in the early nineties and and dyke culture in San Francisco and uh, it was just it just you could. I could stay there for a very long time. So looking for, you know, in doing the, the interviews and, um, and pulling together the story, um, being able to reference those, that footage and, and help uh, audiences really see and experience what Franco and her uh, merry band of fabulous hardworking lesbians <laughs> were, were living. It was everything. I mean, it was the most fun. I never realized that those all those home movies were going to go on to become an actual movie. <laughs> well, you know, well, then that brings me to the next question. Then uh, were you just taping it just to say, well, let's see what we get? Taping it for posterity. What what prompted you to pick up a, a video camera and take it on the road with you and and document those early days? I think part of it was. Um, you know, we knew we were at a pivotal point in time, um, but mostly, you know, when when several of us went out on the road, some women had to stay back and actually, you know, work an everyday, you know, 90 hour work a, a week uh, publishing schedule. So I wanted to bring the video footage back to them so that they could be part of it too. And uh, that was really my impetus for doing it. When I went to the printing press, sometimes I'd take the camera there. Um, and, uh, you know, I really didn't think of it as like own internal. When I filmed most of that stuff, the internet wasn't even really a thing. It's not right. like you could imagine producing right. a, you know, a sign or <laughs> it was so far beyond our, our, our imagination. And thankfully that video didn't oxidize and it was able to be preserved and now it's truly preserved, uh, you know, through this documentary. Can you, either of you, both of us, tell us when was the light bulb moment? Like, we got to make a movie here. We got to make a documentary here. And, and how did that all come about? <laughs> um, well, uh, I would say in the early years of our marriage as I got to know Franco's story more and more and and heard some of these astonishing things that um that happened in her life things like oh you know to finance the magazine i you know nobody would give me the money so i took out 12 credit cards in one day cashed them all out and went to the race track and bet on the horses and won like those kinds of stories <laughs> i kept thinking <laughs> you know this is a great i mean this would make a great movie i think i should I should make a, a fiction film about this. Like it's, I, I can see it, you know, it's a historical piece and it's, it's so juicy and wonderful. So I started to write the, the screenplay. And in researching for that, in speaking with, you know, Franco's colleagues and friends and, and family and, and old girlfriends and, you know, folks from that time period and hearing the all stories to research for myself to get other sources, I realized how how few um, well-resourced historical documentaries there are um, that tell our story, that tell queer women's story. And we don't see our role models so easily, like there's, just, there's so few. Mm -hmm. um, so it became clear to me that this needed to be told first as a nonfiction film, that I needed to do this for us, for our, for our community first. Uh, so that's okay. how that. <laughs> and how- uh, I must say it's- a to have to have your wife make a film about you. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it's beautifully told. It really is beautifully told. Um, you you said uh, you know you must make the documentary first. Does that leave the door open, perhaps for? Uh, you know, something that we may see. Look, we need more lesbian films out there, more lesbian movies, more lesbian characters. I think it would make a fantastic movie. I mean. I, I looked at it, tw I looked at the documentary twice, the part about the racetrack and the credit cards, I'm like, wow, this woman 
this woman's got like some serious uh, yeah. courage, shall we say, uh, to like go big or go home. And she went big. Um, so yeah, it makes for a great yeah. story. So it, does that leave the door open for perhaps maybe, you know, a future maybe. film? Yes, or perhaps an episodic. So I am writing now. Lovely. So stay tuned. Lovely. Something's coming. Lovely, <laughs> lovely. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about uh, just the, the, the political vibe, the atmosphere back in the 90s. Um, during the early days, you know, it, it took a little while for you to get some traction. Um, and then before you know it, you had that big mailbag full of subscriptions. Boom, there it is. And yep. then, you know, the ad revenue probably took a little while to trickle in. You had a couple ads in the beginning. One was your dad. Um, <laughs> talk, talk, I love it. Talk a little bit about the national ads. Um, what was it like back then trying to solicit this to people for, a, you know, an exclusive lesbian magazine? Tell us a little bit about what the climate was like back then. Well, uh, I mean, the impression that I got came up against all the time from advertisers were that lesbians don't spend money, lesbians don't, you know, aren't consumers of the products that, that we know that they are. Um, so why would they advertise, you know, in a magazine like Denove Dense Curve? Um, so they saw the gay men's community as, you know, rich and disp disposable income and the lesbians as, you know, hoarders of hardly any money. So uh, that was a big myth uh, that we fought against continuously. And um, when we first got Bud Light, that was our first national ad. And I was so impressed because they actually went to the trouble of creating a lesbian specific ad. You know, uh -huh. so they, they put the money behind it. Um, and it opened the door for us to not only get other advertisers, but to bring in the income to reach even more women. So it was amazing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that must have been a moment where you're like, okay, we, we've, we're finally, mm -hmm. yeah, we've arrived, got the big ad. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and also in the vein of the political climate, um, uh, it was during the Clinton administration, you know, the mid 90s. Um, how significant was it for you? And was, was the political climate an influence on somewhat of how the magazine would take shape. I know you covered politics, but did it have an effect overall on, you know, what the thought process was, the editorial process? Absolutely. Uh, you know, when I first got the idea for the magazine, um, it was a time of Reaganomics. Uh, it was before Clinton. And, um, you know, when I marched into the bank with my little business suit as a 21 year old, uh, you know, young entrepreneur, and they were like, you know, magazines are failing left and right, and the economy is horrible. And if you want a loan, we're not going to give you one. But if you, even if you could get one, it would be like 20% interest, um, you know, and go away. But kid, you bother us. Um, so we started out in a very negative time for queer people. And then um, when uh, Clinton came into office, we were so hopeful. Um, and of course, the, the first thing we were faced was don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, so we got a little taste of, okay, things are better, but we need to come together more than ever uh, to, you know, to be a community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, back, back in the 90s, we, we, we started to see that the gay community started to really kind of build momentum. And I think you captured that very well, too. And Jen, you captured that really well in, in the film also. Um, you know, I noticed, too, that you there, there's a part in the film where you're sitting around with the NCLR, the National Center for Lesbian Rights, which I thought was well done. And you had you had some young voices in there. Um, mm -hmm you know, asking, is, is a magazine like this still important? What would you both say? Yeah, we all came of age in the 90s. It was wonderful for us. But for the younger generation of women out there, what are you hoping that they, what's their main takeaway you hope from this film? What's the big message that you're hoping for? Is that for Jenna for me? <laughs> for Either me, one or both. What I hope it is, is that um, just like I learned from the women who came before me, a single person can make a huge difference. Yeah. A group of women is even more powerful than they know. 
Um, don't just complain that somebody isn't doing what you think needs to be done, but you know, take a chance, make a difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jim, what would you say? Oh, I, I, I mean, really, it's the same thing. You know, that it's that it's that um, the taking the inspiration from the way that Franco uh, faced the challenges that she faced, and and not waiting for people to give her permission to do the thing that she she needed for herself. By doing that, by by you know, just saying, you know, I'm I'm doing it anyway. I'll find a way. She, she not only met her own needs, she met the needs of an entire community. So, you know, having, I mean, really, really like she, Franco, that, that, that ethos, that, that way of approaching the world, I, I would love for all, everyone seeing this film to take that away. And especially, mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, well, so let me ask you too. Um, I know that when uh, let's let's take it back to the film inside there, Franco. When um, when you were on the road as a young lesbian with Curve Magazine, going from festivals to festivals, Atlanta holds a special place in your heart. Tell us a little bit about it for our Atlanta audience and our Atlanta women and our LGBTQ folks that support us so wonderfully here. Well, Atlanta always holds a special place in my heart. Not only do I have dear friends, lifelong friends that live there, not that I didn't love San Francisco Pride, but the, the, uh, the women in the office could do that, and I could take my uh, team, a couple of us, to go to Atlanta and throw, we threw some big parties for Pride, a peach party um, with thousands of women, and just the energy there, it's really empowering for me to, you know, to go to Atlanta to see um, such a different atmosphere than San Francisco. It is very different. Um, and just feel the warmth of the community there. And I know people from, you know, hundreds of miles away would come to Atlanta for Pride. It was their one outlet of the year. Um, and they looked forward to those, you know, to Pride and to that party, I mean, year round. Even 10 years ago, you were still doing that. But I was, when I was on the scene, I, uh, I remember going several times to, uh, to Peach Pride and, and hosting that party or you know, supporting. I was actually, little me was a bouncer at the door. <laughs> uh, but, I love it. I will never forget it. But you know, the women were so warm and so happy to be there and to be gathering. Uh, it, it was, you know, Atlanta is a very special place. It's yeah, very special. yeah. Well, it, it is a special treat for sure uh, to to speak to you too. Um, the film is lovely. My partner and I watched it uh, uh, a while back. Uh, you know, when we were first screening, and then I watched it just recently again. Um, I look forward to talking to other women and other young LGBT folks, uh, LGBTQ folks to watch it just for the historical point of where we were and where we focus we may need to go. What would you both say uh, after putting this film together? What, you said also the work is not done, Franco, in this film. Tell us what you mean by that and where, where do you see our community headed, especially during this really uncertain time in, in politics in our country. It is a scary time and our rights are, you know, the, the, the rights that we do have are actively being trying to be ripped away from us. Um, you know, uh, what we decided to do um, was uh, to create the Kerr Foundation to elevate the voices within our community, tell our stories and, um, you know, that's our next endeavor. Uh, Jen and I are uh, actively starting that um, with a group of av uh, group of advisors. Um, and uh, when I say the work isn't done, I mean, until we have complete uh, community access, uh, our voices heard um, everywhere and acceptance among the general population, how could we think we're, our work is done? You want to use the letter curve to, you know, to bring in the younger community and to shape what comes next.
Yeah, you can um, track our progress and, and engage with us at thecurvefoundation.org. Excellent. We'll be the launching curve, in the next couple months. Thecurvefoundation.org, excellent. Ladies, again, it was a treat. Thank you uh, for giving us all a voice uh, and, and the film is lovely. And um, you know, we hope to see you ladies soon. To stay well is also. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you. you. I'm to to bring a uh, picture of yourself uh, in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> for our interview. You know, that would be fun. We should all do some kind of 90s like revival thing or something like with the music back then, the clothes. That's the other thing I enjoyed about that archival footage. I'm like, oh, I used to dress like that. And oh, I used to have my hair like that. <laughs> so yeah, we should do some type of 90s thing. So. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Uh, I like it. I, like it. I do too. Thank Take you care. so much for your time today. Bye-bye. Love Thank you, Atlanta. You.